50 year old female who came to us with shortness of breath along with a positive drug history. This negative drug history is also positive drug history. She did not have any history of drug intake, allergy, fever, cough and hemoptysis. Now why I'm giving so much stress to this historical part or this clinical part is because all the types of the interstitial pneumonias that we're going to discuss in this session are going to have a lot of overlapping features, you know. Whenever we talk about interstitial lung diseases, there are only few ways in which lung reacts to different lung diseases, in a different particular uh, diseases, like it can have down glass obesities, nodules, reticulations that we've already talked about. But try to find out the underlying cause or the exact diagnosis is very difficult and it is dependent only upon our clinical picture of this patient. So in this case, not only radiological knowledge is important, but also clinical knowledge. So a thorough history taking is very, very important. And because we as radiologists do not get much time to interact with the patients while a CT is being done, we should have a template of certain important leading questions that we should train our technicians to ask the patient. We have a template at our place and the technicians usually ask some of the important questions that are related here. So these were, this is the short history of this patient. A young female coming on with shortness of breath along with no specific positive history. So I want you to have a look at the cine image of the HRCT of this patient. So this is the cine loop. It starts from the lung apex and thereafter we goes to the lung basis. I just want you to have a look at this image from top to bottom and I want you to jot down the important findings that you can see. So that was about the HRCT in cine loop of the patient. Now before I go ahead and discuss about the intricate details and the system of reporting, I just want you to highlight on three points. That is, whenever you see a case which looks like an interstitial lung disease, you have to answer three questions. First of all, are we dealing with an interstitial lung disease or diffuse lung disease or not? Okay, so that's the first answer that we should have. Second, if we are dealing with an interstitial lung disease, what is the predominant pattern of the disease? The patterns of the disease we've already discussed, whether it's a reticular pattern where we see increased number of lines, it's a nodular pattern when we see dots, or is there in a pattern in which there is increased attenuation or decreased attenuation, which is called by the name of Gronglas opacification and focal air trapping respectively. So these are the two important questions. The third important question that we have to answer is, if, are we dealing with a fibrosing ILD or a non-fibrosing ILD? If you can answer these three questions in a schematic manner, almost half of your work is done. Half of your diagnosis is made. Nobody expects you to give a histopathological diagnosis, but if you can just answer these three points as a resident, as far as a practicing radiologist, that is more than enough for you. So again, I want you to have a look at this image again, but now we'll be keeping in mind those three questions that I just told you. First of all, what is it? Are we dealing with an ILD? Yes, it's a diffuse lung disease because we can see a pattern which is extending all throughout the lung fields in a bilateral symmetrical manner. Then second important question is what are the findings and what is the predominant pattern? So we'll start from the lung epices. So when we start from the lung epices, I hope all of you can see that there are some peripheral based reticulations. Why they are reticulations? Because we are seeing an increased number of lines. I hope all of you can see that there is an increased number of linear pattern along the peripheral aspects of bilateral lung fields. Number one, so we're dealing with a reticular pattern. Do we see any nodules? Do we see any dots? No, we don't see any dots. Here also the reticular pattern is very well seen. We can see that there is an interlobular septal thickening and the peripheral fine mesh-like network which represents intralobular septal thickening. So number one, one thing is for sure that we are dealing with an reticular pattern in an underlying ILD case. Second important thing, I want you to have a look at the bronchi. So if I look at the bronchi, look at these bronchi, do, do, do these bronchi seem tapering to you? They don't look tapering. In fact, they can be traced up to the most peripheral aspect. You see here, they can be traced up to the most peripheral aspect of the lung field. And this is even more relevant when we go downwards, that is lung bases. Here exactly you see these bronchi being traced up to the most peripheral part of the lungs as well. So we are having traction bronchiectasis also. Number one, reticulations. Number two is a traction bronchiectasis, but that is not all. If I go back to this case, starting from top to bottom, I can also see that there is a definite increased attenuation which is located in the lung basis, something we call as crown glass opacities. In fact, this appears to be the predominant pattern. So what we have come across, like what are the major findings that we made? Number one, we are dealing with a diffuse lung disease. Number two, the predominant pattern is loud glass opacification. And 
the findings are reticulations, traction bronchiectasis, and ground glass obesities. Number four, are we dealing with a fibrosing or a non fibrosing ILD? So, traction bronchiectasis in itself is a sign of a fibrosing ILD. So, we're dealing with a fibrosing ILD with a predominant pattern of ground glass opacification. Now, let's have a look at few of the static images of this case and try to make some other important observations that we might have missed on this cine loop. So, I want you to have a look at the static images. Okay, this is the image from our case that we've just seen. And this is the image from a second patient with same pathology. Now, I want you to have a look at just one important landmark and that is the subpleural area. Now, if there is an ILD which is affecting the lung parenchyma, it is expected to involve the entire lung parenchyma starting from the midline up to the most peripheral part. But if I just enlarge it, magnify it, you can see that there is some line here, there is some line here, but immediately the area of the lung parenchyma which is seen in just continuation with the pleura is black, is lucent, is not affected by the ILD. Can I call this particular phenomena subpleural sparing? Yes, technically I can. And if I see this on the contralateral side, the same pathology can be mirrored because we can see a line here, but just underneath this line or between this line and the pleura, the lung appears spared. So this is the classical appearance of this disease, which presenting with subpleural sparing. Okay. I want you to have a look at the second case, which is again a more fervid case because we can see extensive number of lines. So it means it's more fibrosing disease as compared to the first disease that we saw. But again, in this case also, you see that I can draw a line here, which is separating the diseased lung from the normal subjacent lung. I hope all of you can see that the subjacent lung just underneath the pleura is completely spared of the disease process. So this is what we call as subpleural sparing. So this is one important observation that we could make apart from the observations that we've already made. One more thing I want you to have a look at. If I show you this image, magnify it, doesn't this image look very homogeneous? What do I mean by homogeneous? If I divide the two lungs with a line in the midline, these two lungs look like a mirror copy of each other. I mean, the findings on one side actually mirror the findings on the other side. That is, this disease appears to be very homogeneous on involving symmetrically the two lung parenchyma. So this important manifestation is called as spatial homogeneity. Spatial homogeneity, when we see that the disease is appearing very homogeneous, in fact, it is almost symmetrically affecting the two lung parenchyma at the same axial level. Now, this disease also presents with a phenomena called as temporal homogeneity. Now, what does temporal homogeneity mean? Now, this is something that we cannot see on one scan. The word temporal itself means over a period of time. So, what does temporal homogeneity mean? That whenever we are going to take a section of lung parenchyma right now, and if the disease progresses over a period of time, let's say five years and the patient survives and we do a lung biopsy at the same level, then again, the changes in pathology of fibrosis will be homogeneous on two parts of the lung parenchyma.